I'd just like to talk to you a bit about what actually happened to me whenever I took a stand uh, at the Institute of Physics in London. I formed the Energy Stroke Climate Group at the Institute of Physics and um, the very first person that we invited to speak was Professor Richard Lindzen at uh, the Institute of Physics in London. Now when the management people at the Institute of Physics found out that we were inviting him and what he, his position on climate, uh, we were approached by the people at the top, the management, and we were asked, you know, can you not get someone who can take the opposing point of view? And we said, well, well no, actually, we've given the floor to Professor Linson, and we feel that he should speak by himself. And so he came over to London and he spoke. From that moment on, there was a terrible coldness within the senior, oops, the senior management of the Institute of Physics. And we were looked on, really, uh, as people to avoid. So that actually happened. Um, the next invitation that we had was to Lord Lawson. We invited um, Lord Lawson, Nigel Lawson, who was Margaret Thatcher's energy spokesperson, Secretary of State for Energy in her government. And he, although he's not a, a physicist or a climate scientist, he is a very knowledgeable economist. And he wrote a book, and uh, I don't see it here, but it's worth getting. Uh, and uh, he, he took a sceptical point of view to it. And uh, we, in our committee of the energy group, climate group, uh, decided to invite him. And the date was set when the authorities in the Institute of Physics became aware that he was being invited. All sorts of objections were raised, such as, you're spending far too much money on this. You're, you're inviting all these people. We can't afford it, which is nonsense, of course. And you know, there was hundreds that were attending our, our meetings and uh, you're spending far too much on food and drink, and all sorts of objections were raised, silly, stupid objections, but their real intent was actually to try and block it. And they, they infiltrated people into our committee, unknown to ourselves. One or two people were, were slipped in, unknown. And these people disrupted the proceedings, and eventually the invitation was actually withdrawn by the authorities in the Institute of Physics, completely withdrawn, uh, which is a shocking situation to such an eminent person as Margaret Thatcher's right-hand man on energy. It's a disgrace, really, when I, when I think of it. So uh, that was the next thing. Uh, the London branch of the Institute of Physics did not really fully appreciate what was going on, so their secretary approached me and said, we know you're a climate physicist, uh, would you like to write an article for us for the London branch uh, newsletter? And I said, certainly I will, yes. So I wrote this article and uh, it was titled Global Warming is Dying, Global Cooling is Arriving. That was the headline. Again, as soon as the authorities found out this was going to be published in the London branch of the Institute of Physics newsletter, uh, I got an email from one of their senior managers saying this article is not going to be published. And that was the end of the story. So uh, that was complete censorship. Of course they tried to deny that it was censorship. They said that, um, well, uh, uh, we think this should have been peer reviewed. It was, it was not a peer reviewed article. It was a general article on climate. And there's 50 groups in the Institute of Physics, none of their newsletters articles had ever been peer reviewed. So this was just another excuse. The press got onto it and the Times in London got onto it and uh, I actually appeared in the front page of the, of the uh, education edition of the Times. And uh, uh, actually I have it here somewhere. Um, there it is there. Institute denies censoring global cooling article. So I'm keeping that. Uh, as a very important uh, document. So that's basically what happened. I've also written letters to the Physics World uh, magazine of the Institute of Physics, the official publication, several letters over the past six, 
six months criticizing glo uh, anthropogenic global warming, none of which have been published. So there's a complete block. You, you're not allowed within the Institute of Physics to raise your voice against uh, anthropogenic global warming. You're not allowed to raise your voice. The management there are all for what the government position is for, and they will not tolerate anything. It's very, very bad. Although the press in London have, uh, are being a bit uh, more amenable, I have to say that. So let's look at one or two people also involved uh, in London about this. Um, uh, the Climate Research Unit, University of East Anglia, I think you've probably heard about them. Um, uh, let's look at this man, Lord Oxburgh, Lord Oxburgh, who has been the chair. He produced this great five-minute, five-minute, um, or fi not five minutes, five, five uh, pages report. Um, look, who is this man, Lord Oxburgh? Uh, he is the chair of the inquiry. Um, he's an advisor to Climate Change Capital. He's director and vice chairman of Global International, which stands for Global Legislators Organization for a Balanced Environment. Uh, the GLOBE seminar at Copenhagen was addressed by Nancy Pelosi and Ed Markey at Copenhagen. Now, the UK arm of this organization, the British arm of it, GLOBE UK parliamentary team, includes uh, Elliot Morley MP and David Shater MP. These two gentlemen are at present facing fraud charges uh, in connection with the UK parliamentary expenses sca <coughs> scandal. So I don't think they're really the sort of people that really should be on that at all. So that is um, Lord Oxborough. Let's look at the Met Office Chief now, um, Robert Napier, uh, is the new uh, Met Office Director the former head of the World Wildlife Fund, and we know that the IPCC have used some of their uh, own peer-reviewed literature. Uh, he is charged with greening the UK tax system. That is what his job is. By moving 20% of government revenues to green taxes by 2020. He's director of the Climate Change Group, which is an international lobby group involving a coalition of governments and businesses. He's chair of the Homes and Communities Agency, which seeks to buy up land for eco-towns, so-called eco-towns, whatever they are. Uh, he's director of Carbon Disclosure Project, which claims to hold the largest database in the world on corporate carbon footprints. He's also director of the Alliance of Religion and Conservation, dedicated to using religions to push the green agenda. So that's the sort of uh, rundown of these two gentlemen who are very pivotal back in England, back in, in London. And of course, um, another quotation I just want to mention is also uh, from a gentleman called Norman Lamb, MP, which uh, he is actually the son of the founder of Crewe. And uh, to his credit, he came out and was reported in the Daily Mail as saying that Crewe cannot be trusted. He went as far as that. So uh, he would be a good person to have on our side. So I just also want to speak uh, about another experience I had. I was on the panel of a um, uh, series of speakers. I was one of the panelists uh, run by the Institute of Mechanical Engineers in which the principal speaker was the deputy, the deputy uh, of the Sustainable UK Commission, Commission UK Sustainability. Jonathan Parrott is the chair and this guy, I forget his name, was the, the vice chair or his deputy and uh, he spoke about how you know carbon dioxide we're all going to die and everything like that unless we do something all that rubbish and uh, uh, eventually at the end I got up and I said to be honest with you I said the the scientific evidence does not support almost anything that you have said and I totally disagree and I can produce evidence to show that well the vehemence with which I was verbally attacked you know virtually told you know sit down don't you 
dare to challenge me. Don't dare to do that. It was really, I felt like Luther at Wittenberg. You know, you know, I was standing there. I was standing there completely. You know, I can, here I stand, I can do no other, you know. But they were an engineering audience, an engineering audience. And engineers are not like physicists and, and climate scientists, you know. And uh, they, they're not so... Uh, well, they, 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 take, they take it all and don't question it. Um, also, another point I'd like to mention is about politics. You've got to get involved with politics, and I'm glad that Dr. Robinson is running for, for the uh, Congress. Another good politician, yes, another good politician, whether you've ever heard of him or not, is Sammy Wilson. Now, Sammy Wilson is the finance minister at present in the devolved government in Belfast. It's, there's three devolved governments, one in Scotland, one in Wales, and one in Northern Ireland. Sammy Wilson is the, is the finance officer, and, and he has also taken a stand, and he has been vehemently attacked as well. You know, and at that meeting at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, which I, as a physicist, was on the, pa <coughs> the panel, they laughed at Sammy. They laughed at him, you know, in their ignorance. Uh, but Sammy has taken a stand, and I think that's the only way because this whole thing is actually a political, uh, as, as the politics involved is tremendous. And really all this movement of money out of America and out of Britain uh, to uh, foreign countries and all like that. The, the poor in Nairobi do not need uh, windmills on, on their roofs. What they need is running water. And I think it's really part of communism. Central tenet of communism is the redistribution of wealth, and that's what's really going on. This guy that that um, formed or, or was responsible for Kyoto, uh, the, the the instigator from the United Nations, Morris Strong. Morris Strong is a dedicated communist, and he's also uh, chair of the New Age movement. Now, the new the New Age movement is an organisation dedicated to the destruction of uh, Western growth, right? It's actually quite, it'll be quite open about that. So he was definitely the founder of the New Age movement. He's now living in communist China. And uh, I think, I, I know it has been reported that Prince Charles is associated with the New Age movement. I'm, I'm not absolutely sh certain about that. Um, but anyway. Um, so basically, you've got to get involved with politics. Let's also mention the two prime ministers, the outgoing prime minister in Britain and the incoming prime minister. Mr. Brown, who has lost the election, as you've probably read about, um, he called all people that, all scientists that did not agree with anthropogenic global warming, flat earthers. So all you who, who uh, do not agree with uh, anthropogenic global warming, you're all flat earthers, according to, to Mr. Brown, the outgoing British Prime Minister. And the incoming man, uh, Mr. Cameron, is really not much better. Uh, one of his, one of the quotations I have from him is, he said, the best way, David Cameron, the new British Prime Minister, the best way of providing a really secure supply of energy is by shifting our whole economy away from fossil fuels and onto renewable energy. So in other words, he's a wind power uh, individual. Uh, the British government have given something like a hundred million pounds to develop wind energy, uh, including also the London Array, which is to be the biggest offshore wind farm in the world. And uh, the the estimate of that would be at least 80 billion, enough to bankrupt the British, the British economy. And something like subsidies of 30 billion a year by the year 2020. So they're, they're all for this wind power and we know that uh, it's not working. Germany has 20,000 wind turbines which are only producing about 5% of its electricity, 6% of its electricity and not one coal-fired plant in Germany has been closed down as a result. So really, that's, that's what we're really involved with. Um, another 
few facts that you might be interested to know about is again connected with um, connected with uh, wind power is that Eon, the big energy company, Eon, uh, in their evidence to the House of Lords, in their evidence to the House of Lords committee, have said that for every 1,000 megawatts of installed wind capacity, you're going to need 900 <coughs> megawatts, 900 megawatts of uh, conventional capacity, fossil fuel or nuclear. You know, and and, and all these. Uh, these liberal uh, environmentalist uh, scientists, they never mention that. You know, we're going to have, uh, and the politicians like the guy up in Scotland, uh, forget his name, the Republican guy, he, um, uh, the, the first minister there, he says, oh, we can survive. We'll stack, stack some wind up in Scotland. We'll be all right. You know, we can bend, we don't need fossil fuel. We don't need nuclear power. You know, we can survive in wind energy. It's a complete myth. It will lead to the collapse of any country that re relies entirely on wind energy. Their economy will collapse. So that's, that's the problem. And certainly in Britain, we have uh, the problem that um, a lot of the politicians that get in uh, have no experience at all of engineering science at all, right? I mean, Lord uh, Toombs, I attended a lecture at the Institute of Physics in London. Lord Toombs, who was the ex-chair uh, uh, of the Electricity Council in Britain, and uh, he said that there is not one person in the British government has any engineering stroke, applied science stroke, climate science knowledge, whatever. They're all Oxford and Cambridge liberal arts people, and uh, they think they know it all, you know. But, uh, good luck to Dr. Robinson and good luck to Sammy Wilson. That's what we need. And we are not going to win this battle. We are not going to win this battle on science alone. We've won the battle on science. We must get more politicians involved, both in America and in the UK. Okay.